So, um, as Kathy said, I'm Mintu Pham. I'm Senior Policy Director with the UN Foundation. And uh, the reason why I'm involved in the post-2015 development agenda is because my organization is incredibly um, interested in and, and committed to the uh, Millennium Development Goals and the outcomes that it has produced. Um, if you look at where we were in 2000, when we uh, looked at this agenda and we said, uh, as a global community, there are certain things that we want to see um, happen around the world. Um, there were some real priorities that were laid out there. The eight Millennium Development Goals uh, were a sort of crowning achievement for the UN in coming together and saying, as a global community, we should be able to cut poverty in half. We should be able to make sure that women don't die of childbirth, that children um, are, don't die of preventable diseases, that there are um, um, some basic human needs, social needs that people, that people uh, should have. And in fact, um, out of that process, you've seen that there's been a lot of great momentum. Um, I think for the most part, people would say that the MDGs, we've made a lot more progress than we thought. Um, you know, we, are we on track to achieving all eight MDGs everywhere in the world? No, but this is what happens when you have goals. You try to set yourself some standards, some uh, ideas that you're really aiming for, and then you do your best to try to achieve them. And the Millennium Development Goals were to try to achieve, we, were, we as a world decided that we would uh, try to achieve the MDGs by 2015. And in fact, as many of you may know, we have cut extreme poverty in half. Uh, between tw uh, 2000 and 2010, the total number of out-of-school children worldwide has declined uh, from 100 million to 58 million. Um, gender parity in schooling worldwide is closest to being achieved at the primary level with a one-to-one -one ratio between the enrollment of girls and boys. We now have 17,000 fewer children dying each day than in 1990, which is, which is uh, very important. Maternal mortality has fallen by 45%. We still have a long way to go, um, but that's a lot of progress. Global malaria cases, as you, many of you know, um, you know, malaria is a disease that children don't have to die from. And then if you have a bed net or if you have some treatments, then you can, we can cut down those numbers. And we've been able to, between 2000 and 2013, uh, drop malaria cases um, from 233 million to 219 million in 2010. So essentially the MDGs have helped make a lot of progress. And on the backs of that, people said, okay, we're close, we're nearing 2015. What are we going to do to replace that? What are the next set of goals? And uh, I think some of this core social uh, issues that you saw in 2000, now a lot of people are saying, you know what, it's not enough for children not to die of preventable diseases. It's not enough just to get myself out of extreme poverty. We want to be able to have, people around the world want to be able to ha live the lives that you all do. They want to be, be able to have a decent education, a uh, high quality education, to be able to make sure that uh, they have job opportunities and that their economies can grow and that they have the kinds of opportunities that we all take advantage of every day. And so it's not ju now just an agenda about the bottom billion, although that's still incredibly important and we can't lose sight of that. Um, now it's also about how do we make everyone's lives better? And while at the same time we don't jeopardize the future of the planet. And so for 2030 now, the ambition for the post-2015 development agenda, a convoluted way of saying the next set of development goals that we want to achieve, that that next agenda is about, one, ending extreme poverty. So being the very first generation ever to end extreme poverty. You think of that kind of ambition that that takes, um, but the fact that we've already been able to cut it in half means that actually we could probably, we have a chance at cutting, ending poverty completely. And then the second thing is being the first generation, I'm sorry, the first generation to end poverty, and then the second thing is being the last generation to deal with climate change. Those two issues are really what's at stake in 2015. The big moments in 2015 next year are in September, where we as a world will get together just down the street at the UN to decide on how we're going to deal with poverty and these issues and live sustainably. And then in December, 
how we're gonna address climate, and I think Tracy here will address some of that a little bit later. But really, this is an incredibly important moment because we don't have, if we don't, there's no plan B after 2015. There's not, you know, oh, we didn't do so well in the, in the negotiations, let's just start again in 2020 or in, you know, in, in 2025. This is an agenda where all um, governments around the world private sector, civil society, academic institutions like this one are all galvanizing around what is that moment and how do we make the best of it to both end extreme poverty and deal with climate change next year. And I don't think, I can't overemphasize that. There's a lot at stake. There's, a, there's a, the opportunity for uh, people around the world for, um, if you think about it, 130, I think over 130 children will be born next year. What will their lives be like when they're 15? Will they be living the conditions that um, uh, the kids do this now? Will we be able to actually find a way to live sustainably so that they actually have a future for their children and their grandchildren going forward? I think it's a really big moment. I think it's also a big test for the UN. Um, I think, you know, there's some cynicism around whether international cooperation works. People look at Syria, they look at Ukraine, they look at Ebola, and they say, you know, it's easy to throw your hands up in the air and say, you know what, sometimes we just can't, as a world, solve these problems together. But in fact, I think what the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, showed us is that, in fact, we can, as a world, come together and decide that there are some basic things that no one in the world should be able to suffer from, and there are, as a community, problems that we will try to work together to solve. And so next year, both of those tests on, ending, on um, ending poverty, extreme poverty, and dealing with climate change is a big test for whether we really can, as a global community, come together and solve these big problems together. And so um, we're on that path right now. Negotiations inside the UN have been happening for the better part of the last two years. And uh, what we've seen is, uh, in those negotiations, countries coming together and deciding that there are 17 goals, now this time around, rather than the eight MDGs, 17 goals um, that we will try to aspire to achieving, and 169 targets. Um, the Millennium Development Goals, as a comparison, had eight goals and 21 targets. Um, I could go over all of those, but I think uh, those of you who've studied this will know, and you can also look to see what those 17 goals and 169 targets coming out of the UN have been. But what, what makes these different is, as I said, they cover a whole range of issues, a breadth of issues that we didn't try to tackle in the MDGs. Um, this is about ending poverty, dealing with education, health issues, maternal mortality, water and sanitation, those sort of social, um, and, uh, social issues that we had in the MDGs. But then this time around, we're also adding on environmental and sustainability issues. So there are sustainable consumption and production. And what that largely means is how will we decide to, what are the kinds of things that we will decide to do to use less, produce and consume less, so that we have more for future generations still to come. And I think some of you, you can imagine that's a huge political question. It's always very difficult to, pe to get people to consume less, to use less, to reuse and recycle. It's very, very difficult to do that. Politically, governments are very hesitant to sign up to that. If you can imagine a government like the one in a country like the one you're sitting in trying to impose that, you can imagine what domestic constituents would say. It's very politically difficult, but now that those ideas are now in the next set of development goals. Economic opportunities. How can we make sure that as we grow our economies, we're still being able to provide jobs for people? Some people say that the technology revolution is providing jobless growth. So while our economies may be growing, we aren't able to, we're, we're, um, we're using technology to maybe in some ways replace jobs for people. What does that then mean? Are we then just increasing inequality between people within and uh, among countries? How do we tackle those big questions? And they are highly political questions, but economic uh, opportunity, economic growth, as well as inequality are also in this next set of development goals. Climate change. Again, I, I think you'll hear a little bit more about that later. But as you can imagine, very, very difficult issues, negotiations between countries about what they're really willing to do on climate. 
And so while many people could say that in the MDGs, this was an, an agenda, the Millennium Development Goals had global consensus. This time around with the sustainability goal, uh, with the sustainable development goals, people are saying this is a lot more difficult. What makes this more difficult? First, as I said, it's the breadth of the issues. We're covering a whole lot more issues on the table, 17 goals now. But it also, there's a, there's a principle of universality that's now being brought into the goals, meaning the MDGs may have just applied to developing countries, poor countries, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia and Latin America. This time around, that's not enough. These countries are saying, well, hang on a second. If you're going to have us sign on to goals, what about you, donor countries? What about you, the high uh, income countries? What will you actually sign on to? And that's why you see issues like sustainable consumption and production, climate change, economic opportunity, inequality embedded in these goals now. So in a universal agenda, these are goals that countries like the United States will also have to take on. What will the US do on each one of these things? What will you know, the Europeans do for themselves and their own citizens? So this isn't just about you know, the, um, the villager in, you know, somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. This is about you know, a child growing up in you know, the Bronx and in um, parts of middle America. And, and you know, this, is, this is an agenda that the US will also have to own and other um, developed countries will also have to own. And that makes it much more difficult. Um, the actors that are involved this time around. So in the Millennium Devel Development Goals, governments got together, they decided on the goals, they decided on how they were going to um, um, uh, implement it, and then several years later, NGOs, civil society groups, companies said, actually, you know what, they're onto something, maybe then we will also help and participate. This time around, the actors are, are um, at the table from the get-go. So the UN has gone through great pains to try to get uh, as many perspectives as possible. So civil society has been engaged, people around the world have been engaged. How many of you have seen the My World survey? Okay, so everyone go to myworld2015.org. Please do, the more young voices they, they get to see, the better. But this is a survey that the UN has put out online with 16 ideas and then you get to rank them. What are the most important to you? Is it education? Is it health? Is it making sure you have an honest and responsible government? Uh, those kinds of issues are there and it's a way to sort of bring in new voices. So the actors are different. Um, we're really trying to engage everyone in this in, in, because everyone will have, to, will have to have a role to play. And the politics of this are incredibly difficult. I think uh, there's a recognition now that the geopolitics have changed. We're not just looking at rich countries and poor countries anymore. There's a whole host of you know, emerging economies, middle income countries that have a greater say. And as I said, you know, they're not satisfied with just getting themselves above the, you know, uh, out of extreme poverty. They want more. And unless we can really figure out, it's not just a donor recipient relationship. It's not just us in developed countries giving aid to poor countries. It's really about how do you put in place the right policy frameworks um, and, and, um, um, and structures to lift everybody up. Um, and that is a highly political question. Um, and so I think the role of some of these emerging economies is absolutely important, really, really important as we think about the geopolitics of this and, and uh, the role that everybody has to play. And so you'll see that embedded in the Sustainable Development Goals. And so as I said, so next year, there are going to be three big conferences um, around the what of this agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, the declaration, the, uh, the, the uh, description of what it is that we actually want to achieve with the goals and targets themselves. The how of the, and that will be done uh, during the UN conference next September. The how of this, so how much is it going to cost? How are we actually going to deliver this? What kind of aid will we, will we um, will we be able to put up to this, as well as being able to use um, uh, aid to, to leverage private sources of, of funding, and I think you'll hear a little bit about that as well. What, is the what are the data needs here? So with the MDGs, we had eight goals, 21 targets, and 
we had a lot of um, data gaps in just being able to understand where people are, um, what's the situation there, how much progress are we really making. With 17 goals and 169 targets, I think you'll hear in a little bit that that is an even bigger challenge. Um, and in a lot of these countries that don't have a lot of capacity, how are they going to measure um, and count you know, people all the way out in a very remote location, how are they going to really bring them into this so that we know whether we are meeting the goals and targets that we set out? So all of this, all of this is to say um, that there are incredibly high expectations. This is very highly politicized, but we also have a whole lot at stake in terms of multilateralism and whether we can prove that the global community can come together to solve problems. A lot at stake in terms of the planet. I mean, sometimes you'll hear people say there's no plan B for the planet. That's the more important plan B uh, um, metaphor there. Um, and, and, uh, and then also, you know, what kind of outcomes do we want to see for our children and our grandchildren? I'm mostly interested in the questions that you have, so uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that and let my colleagues speak. But please do um, become involved. Go to My World 2015. Follow this process. Um, I am on Twitter, M2, the number two, fam, uh, is my Twitter handle. Um, and you can also go to the UN Foundation website to find out more, but especially do try to um, be engaged. Youth voices are incredibly important. This is going to be your future um, that, that, uh, that we're trying to deal with here. So thank you so much and um, looking forward to your questions.